So, as of now, I am simply defining this notions of independence, conditional probabilities and all. So, as we move on, you will see that to certain results, as we start analyzing the system, certain analysis become simpler if the independence conditions hold. So, as we move along, we want to bit maybe model somewhat complex cases where it will involve many, many events, but uh, defining a probability for every joint. So, you, you have this script of right, it will consist of so many events. Okay. Now, instead of, now to define probability function, we need to apply given number to each of the elements in this whatever like I do not know how many events it contains. Let us say it contains n events. But suppose somehow this event turns out to be independent, I only need to define probabilities for each of the elements in my sample space. For the others, I can just get multiply for each. If I take a set in this and let us say each of the elements in that are such, okay. if I take a set or multiple sets and if they happen to be independent. Now, if I have a probability for each of the sets and they happen to be independent, all I need to do is just multiply them. Otherwise, I need to define probability for each one of them. So, if there is an independent, my definition of probability becomes simpler. All I need to define probabilities for the individual events. From that, I can derive for all the joint events. Okay, in that way, independence brings lot of simplicity when I have to analyze a big chunk of events. For example, if you want to find the probability that that happened, this happened, that is going to happen, all these things. And if you know that they are independent, all you need to know is the probability of each of these terms. Okay, fine. So, now moving on, we are going to study this concept of total probability. So, the basically the law of total probability tells us that if I want to find probability of an event, we need to just look at its disjoint sets okay? and how we are going to find that disjoint set by looking at some partition of my space and look at how much of this events falls in each of these partitions. So, let me make it more clear now. All of you understand what is a partition? Okay, so, as we are going to say E1, E2, Pk, set 2, partition omega if And so basically, let us say if you have an let us say this is your sample space omega, one possible partition could be like this simply E1, E2, E3, E4. 
So, E1, E2, E3, 4, they are disjoint and they are such that their union covers my entire my sample space. Now, suppose let us say in this you have an event A. This is some event which is a subset of my sample space. Now, if I want to find probability of this event, so do you think that if I know something about the probability of this E1, E2, E3 should help me? Because some portion of this event A falls in E4, some portion in E3, some in E2 and some in E1. So, if I know somehow cal calculate each of these portions, I should be able to compute the probability of the event A itself. So, that is what exactly the law of total probability says. So, if I have A, can I write A as A E1 plus A E2 plus let us say A E A. Is this correct? So, for example, here A E1 means this portion and A E2 means this portion and this is true because my E1, E2 all the way up to E k are disjoint. If they are not disjoint, this is not necessarily correct. Now, are this A E1, A2 themselves are disjoint? Right, because E1, E2 are disjoint, it is necessary that A E1, A2, A E all the way up to A k themselves are disjoint. Now, can I apply if what is then probability of A is going to be? So, probability of A is going to be probability of A E1 plus probability of A E2 all the way up to probability of A E k. Why is that? And what property of probability I applied here? The third property, right. So, I have finitely many mutually exclusive events here. So, they, their union should, the probability of their union is nothing but some of their probabilities. Now, I want to further use my definition of conditional probability here. So, can you tell me in terms of the conditional probability how I can write this as? Let us say probability of E i is not equals to 0. Okay, so, write it as a conditional on the event E i. How you are going to write this? Okay, so let me write this for you too, guys. Now think of A, B, A as my A, B as E1. So then I can write my this A as probability of A given. E1 into E1 all the way up to probability of A given EK into right. Now, do anybody see any usefulness of this formula here? Fine, I have just manipulated. Uh, my definition of conditional probability and express in this form. Do you think uh, the way right expressing it in this form should be of any use anywhere? Can anybody imagine why at all it is useful? Yeah, it is not given, but uh, suppose assume that you know these probabilities of E1, E2, E3, E4, you have some information about them. So, you know that like suppose you have omega you know that uh, omega 
is you can be partition like that you have further information on that I mean prior information and uh, you know what is the probability of each of this partition in that way do you think you can leverage that information to compute these probabilities so suppose let's say i tell you this events e1 e2 ek partition and i know this probability further i know conditional probability of a on this partitions these are partitions which i have defined at my convenience and uh, whenever this condition of this partition that the portion of a falling in each of this partition that is a probability of a given ei i know i am maybe let's say i can compute then using this formula you are just you can compute what is the probability of a so what is this problem problem what is this formula basically telling you portion of a falling in e1 portion of a falling in e2 portion of a falling in ak right but before i take this that portion of a falling in e1 then i have to also take the probability of e1 happening itself right so that is why if i know what is the probability of each one of these partitions happening and what is the likelihood that my event a happening condition that then if i going to take the uh, sum of all these things that is going to give me the probability of a okay so let's say let's take a simple example okay before i write an example let me give something called bayes formula okay so here i have told you to compute p of a you need to know that condition on e1 what is the probability of a happening but suppose yeah this is what i have this probability is e1 e2 i have defined a priori and i also said you that i have somehow computed the probability of a given e e1 e2 all these things these are like prior prior probabilities that i have computed from this i got probability of a suppose now i will say you prob i will ask the reverse question event a has happened what is the probability that it might have been due to e1 so that is i want to ask e1 given a i am now asking basically posterior probability so these are my prior probabilities i have based on my partition now i think okay fine event a has happened that i observed now what is that it has uh, this is due to e1 now can you express this in terms of this so let me call this as posterior prior probabilities and this as prior probabilities can you express my posteriors into the in, in terms of the priors how so this one i know already by definition of my conditional probability this is probability of e1 a divided by p of a right but this one i can further again apply the definition of conditional probability to express it as p of a e1 into p of e1 right and then p of a i have just applied the definition of my conditional probability and now this p of a i am going to use my this law of total probability which i have already derived expressed in terms of my conditional probability so i am going to just write it as p of p of e1 
P of P1 divided by summation of P of Right? And this is what we call it as Bayes formula. And this is indeed one of the important formulas we have we come across in analysis. Okay, let us try to see how what is the usefulness of this formula. So, what this formula is basically correct is the posterior probability based on my prior info probabilities, right. Prior info probabilities is something which I compute a priori and uh, how that is going to help me in computing my posterior probability. So, let us see an example. Let us say you are working with a system and that, that system has some critical component. Let us say it is your satellite that you want to launch and that satellite has some critical thing and uh, you have built in enough redundancy in your system that if this critical component works fine, everything should go normal. If this critical component fails, it is still possibility that your mission goes through, even this uh, go through, ok. Now, the prior information you have tried to compute is failure or success of this critical component, ok. Uh, uh, there are only two possibilities, right, failure or success of this critical component and given this system fails, what is the probability that your mission still complete successfully? Or, or not. Let us say you have that, you have computed this through your various lab experiments that you do extensively in, uh, in your offline uh, test modes, ok. So, let us say you have that uh, information. So, So, when I say f, this is the failure rate of my critical component I have. So, this is uh, some very high pressure unit or whatever, let us say I test it in the lab environment, I say I see that when I put it into actual test mode with probability p, it fails and I have that information. And now, let us say I also have this, suppose critical component fails, what is the probability that my mission still succeeds? So, let us uh, let us call this ok or instead of that like let us say that critical component fails, my system still works. So, that is what W I mean working condition. You also have computed it based on your lab environment like you based on your prior experiments. And let us call this probability y and uh, let us call it r minus x. And now let us say you have probability that it works when your critical component fails. Let us say that is some y and then probability that reverse does not fail is 1 minus y. So, this is all you can compute right like before you actually launch your uh, mission, you can do various experiments and uh, try to compute and uh, get these uh, numbers. Now, based on this information, so these are all your prior probabilities that you could compute. Now, based on that, let us say you want to compute the probability that
you observed that your mission worked well you are you you are successful but what was the probability that it was successful in spite of the fact that the critical component failed so this is the posterior probability maybe you want to compute like okay fine you observed that your mission actually went through now that is the condition what is that it went through in spite of that your critical component failed now can you compute this probability based on your prior probabilities what formula you are going to use yeah so what is the base theorem you are going to apply so this i can write it as p of w by f into probability of f divided by p of w given f now everything is exp expressed in terms of the things which you already computed beforehand do you know what is this probability of w given f yes right you know what is p of f yes i know, i have already computed that and i have already computed all these things so based on my prior probability i can go back and compute okay what is the probability that my mission actually succeeds actually succeeded and uh, in spite of uh, there is a failure uh, in, in my critical component so okay let's say another simple example uh, maybe that you can relate a bit more so let's say you have a question for that question you either know the answer or you don't know the answer okay what is the probability you know the answer with probability p and uh, probability 1 minus p you don't know the answer and what you guys do when you don't know the answer you guess so and when you guys guess you guys know you are always not going to be lucky right so you are going to be taking a risk and that's where this probability comes you need to see with what probability you are going to succeed and then uh, let's say if you don't know the answer what is the probability that you end up guessing it correct let's say that probability is some 1 by m okay and uh, then probability that you will not when you don't know the answer but your guess ended up in a wrong answer let's say that is going to be 1 by m and then we can also compute okay what is when you know the answer you are going to always make it uh, correct right you are going to get the correct one let's say that probability is 1 and uh, probability that c complement is is going to be zero suppose as an exam setter somebody setting multiple choice questions he, he he derives this set he comes up with this statistics and he want to be be fair he want to make sure that he want to set a question paper in such a level that the guy who actually got the correct answer he got it correct because he knew the answer it's not that uh, he he got it correct because he just guessed it smartly he want to max he want to find out this probability so that guy got the answer correctly but he got it correct because he knew the answer 
you want to compute this is my posterior probability I want to compute. So, if I want to compute based on this information how I am going to do this can I do it at all how so can you compute this So, let us substitute these values. So, if you know it correct, it is correct and what is P of k? It is P and what is this? This is P plus what is C k complement 1 by m and what is this? It is 1 minus P. So, let us try to understand like how does this? Suppose you increase p, fix m. If you increase p, this this probability is going to increase or decrease. This this function is an increasing function in p or decreasing function in p. Increasing function. So it is good, right? Like if you know the answer, fine. The probability that you actually got the correct, it is increasing. Now, let us say m here denotes the number of questions, the number of questions you have in your multiple choice. Now, suppose you want to be fair for your students. When I say fair, you want to make sure that if you got the correct, you, you want the exam, exam to be robust in the sense that if you got it correct, he got it correct because he knew it with high probability. So, if you want to do that and m is your choice that is the number of choices you can give. So, you want to increase m or decrease m? What is happening with increasing m? So, if you increase m this is also increasing right. So, that means uh, you, you are trying to make your uh, exam paper more robust. So, as you can see here like fine like I may not be able to model things exactly, but this gives me in a some sense to, to model some things and get some interpretation out of it. Okay? And you see like plethora plethora of uh, applications where this uh, bias formula comes kicks in. Some of them we are going to see it in the assignments. So, now after this I want to move on to the definition of random variables. So, what is random variable? It says something random right some value which is random. So, in many experiments our outcomes will be kind of uh, descriptive right. For example, when you toss a coin the outcome is like I expressed in descriptively like either heads or tails or uh, when, you, when you go to a casino your outcome is just you, you won or loss. But win and loss may be associated with some numbers also right like you won because you got more than this many points or you lost because you, you did not get these many points. So, instead of making this outcomes very objective, maybe it is better, we are better off by assigning some numbers to this objective, right. We actually did that already in the case of dice. In the case of dice, we threw it and we say outcome is 1, 2, 3, 4 like that, right. Th these are the different possible outcomes, but we actually assign the numbers there. And in many, many experiments that you do in life, it is not necessary that the outcome is always numbers. The outcome is some description, 
okay this happened this happened among all these 10 possibilities like if you are going to say weather uh, outcome of the weather outcome of the weather could be sunny rainy cloudy whatever different options are there right instead of explaining them in this descriptive way maybe you want to assign numbers okay I mean just make it uniform less than this much temperature we are going to call it humid less than uh, above this temperature we are going to call it sunny or something of that sort. So what basically random variables will do is it will try to quantize the outcomes in terms of numbers so that it become more amenable to our analysis. Okay. So let me first give a formal definition of what I mean by a random variable. So to define a random variable, I need to have this underlying probability space. I only need basically the first two components, omega and script f, you will see why. And this random variable is basically a function from your sample space to real line. When I say r, this is real line. That means for every possible outcome in your sample space, it is going to assign a real number but that is it not that it is not just a random variable if it is a function like this further it has to be f measurable okay now what I mean by f measurable f measurable says that For all C in R, so this is the definite meaning of F measurability. It means you take any C, and if I ask the question, the number of outcomes. That, uh, the, the set of outcomes that are going to take value possibly less than or equals to C, this is going to define a set, that set has to be belong to event space. So what it is basically asking for? I said x a random variable is basically a function which is going to assign numbers to the outcomes. So now I have mapped all my outcomes to numbers, right? Now in such experiment, I want to ask the question, what is the probability that my outcome of the experiment takes value less than or equals to C? So for example, in your case of dice throw, I could ask the question, what is the probability that outcome of the dice is less than or equals to 5? Okay? In that case, this is exactly, so that is set of all outcomes that are going to take value less than or equals to 5 and that event whatever it is, it has to belong to this script f. 
and why is this if I it belongs to script f then only I can assign probabilities to that right because my probability space is such that I am going to assign probabilities to only to the events that belong to event space. So, that is why and why I am allowing and notice that this condition need to be satisfied for every C. You may ask any question of this form what is what is that outcome of my experiment is going to be less than 10. You may ask what is the outcome of my experiment is going to be less than 10.003. Whatever the number you are going to ask for that I want to be able to assign a probability and I could do that if that event belongs to my event space. That is why for any C I want this to be belong to my script F. So, basically what we are saying is a random variable is a function that maps my outcomes to real numbers and it is such that for every possible real number the set of outcomes that takes value less than that real number should be an event that lies in my event space. Okay? Fine. So, let us look at an example what is a random variable and what is not a random variable. So, let us take the simple case of our dice problem. In, in my dice throw problem what are the outcomes? Outcomes are In this outcome, I am also let us say I am also going to define my event space on this. Take let us take one special case. So, let us take uh, I have 1 3 and let us say I have 2 4 5 6 and uh, I have 1, 2, 3, 4 and I have 5. I have defined this to be my event space. And let me first define a random variable on this like this which is going to assign to every outcome a real number. In this case what I am going to do? I am going to assign omega to be simply omega for all omega in So, my outcomes are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I am going to define a random variable x which is just going to give the same numbers as the outcome. In this case, it is a trivial example because outcomes already in terms of the numbers, but it is not necessary that the outcomes need to be in terms of numbers. For example, head, tail, we already talked about, right? Okay, fine. I have just defined a map from omega to r. Now, before I call it a random variable on this experiment it has to be f measurable. Is it f measurable? Yes, sure. So, how you are going to check f measurability here? I have given you the definition of f measurability here. Why? Three, three, so, let us apply this. Let us take some C, right? C belong to R. Let me and this should be true for any for every C, right? So, I have a freedom to choose C. So, let me choose C to be 3. Now, and what is that? In that case, what is this set is going to be? 1, 2, 3 and now I have an event which consists of outcomes 1, 2, 3. Does that belong to my F here? No, right? So, this is not a random variable on this F, but suppose let us expand this. I let me include 1, 2, 3 and if I include 1, 2, 3 let me also include its complement. 4, 5, 6. Now, for c equals to 3, this satisfies. 
is it now still an f measurable okay let's take c equals to 1 c equals to 1 outcome is just 1 1 does not belong to f so let me include that also now is it uh, f measurable no for what it violates it violates 2 so let me now let us include all possible values okay how many subsets are there let us say all subsets are there okay all possible subsets are there now is it f measurable yes so you take any possible c you will end up with one of this one and uh, that belongs to f so it's not necessary that every function that you are going to define on a sample on on your uh, sample space is a random variable it has to be f measurable that is because i can the very purpose of me defining a random variable by may assigning numbers to the outcome is that i want to measure events and this is exactly doing that and if this measurability condition fails that random variable maybe the way i have applied defined my random variable is not appropriate one okay fine so let's stop here then uh, you will see the, so as you see like uh, maybe you need to just uh, digest this fact that any function on sample space need not be a random variable it has to be appropriately satisfying uh, my measurability conditions okay